Did you hear that? It's the start of the music lecture. So last time we talked about speech, and today we're talking about music, and so that might lead you to believe that those two things are quite different from one another. But we're going to start today by complicating the idea that they are quite different, and by blurring the boundaries between speech and music. I want to start by just asking you to listen to a sentence. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. If I were to ask you to repeat the last phrase of that, you'd probably say something like this. Sometimes you behave so strangely. Now I'm going to have you listen to that phrase on repeat a few times. Sometimes behave so strangely. 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 Now, if I asked you to repeat it, you'd probably say something more like this. Sometimes so All right, but here's the really cool part. Now I'm going to play the first sentence that you heard for you again. This is the exact same thing you heard the first time. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. It sounds really different now, right? It's like she just bursts into song in the middle of her sentence. This demonstration reveals something very cool about the relationship between speech and music. What this suggests is that it's not just the bottom-up properties of the stimulus that affect how we hear them. It also is affect our perceptual experience is also affected by how we perceptually organize that stimulus. So even though that first recording that you heard, even though that stimulus was exactly the same the first time you heard it and after the repetitions, you experienced it very differently. So the repetitions that you heard lead us to organize that stimulus more as music than as speech. And the reasons for these aren't entirely clear, but the speculation is that when we initially hear speech, we're listening to it for its content. We're parsing it for meaning. After we have identified what the meaning is, now we're listening to its form. We're listening to the melodies of the language. So what this suggests is that music and speech are not differentiated by the physical properties, that the same stimulus can be interpreted as music or speech, depending on how we perceptually organize it. This idea is going to become important in just a bit as we talk about the emotional content of music. We've talked a lot about auditory perception kind of scientifically and mathematically, right? Harmonics are multiples of the fundamental frequency. Stuff bonks into stuff in the cochlea that leads to neurons being depolarized. But there's this other thing about auditory perception, specifically music. Music feels good. Most things that make us feel good make us feel good because they're evolutionarily beneficial, right? Sex, eating sugar, avoiding danger. Those have clear evolutionary benefits. But if there are evolutionary benefits to liking certain combinations of sounds, those are a lot less obvious. And yet, music is this important part of our lives. It's universal. Every human culture has music. And it dates back thousands of years. We have instruments that are 50,000 years old, and people were making music with their bodies and their mouths long before that. So there is something that is special and universal about music. So why is it that combinations of noises can make us feel good? One clue may come from the links with language. I'm going to play a clip of a person speaking to a baby. Even if you don't know the language, you don't know what she's saying, I want you to try and figure out what kind of message she's communicating to the baby. É esse, pois, esse é cavalo. There's no way she's telling the baby, hey, get your hand off that hot stove, right? We can tell something about the, the emotional content of the message that she's conveying, even if we don't understand the words. And there ends up being a lot of consistency in the melodies of the language that we use across languages. Let's listen to Anne Frenald talk about her research on these cross-linguistic patterns of the music and language. This is from an episode of Radiolab on musical language. We would ask the parents to show the baby they were happy. Good boy, now you got it. Just using their voice, show them you're happy with that. Das, acha teri gadi ke tera gadi? Hindi. Ai não sabe qual é o cavalo? Portuguese. É esse pois, esse cavalo. And what these things had in common was that the melody was a kind of a of a rise fall. Damn. Good girl. Good girl. You got it. Yeah. Good girl, sweetie. So it doesn't matter what words the parents are saying, it's always really about this melody. Mm. 
quickly. Now, with a prohibition, in contrast, your goal is to stop the child from doing something. The category that says stop. Quite a different melody. It's short. It's sharp. In musical terms, it's staccato. There is the category of look. Pay attention to that. Mothers frequently use rising pitch. Nora, look, look, sweetie. They frequently use higher pitch. A unicorn. A unicorn. So when we speak, we use a form of music. Prosody, the intonation of our voices, differentiates what I mean when I say, "Oh yeah, I know her," versus "Oh yeah, I know her." Right? Those mean very different things depending on the inflections that I use. And so, if we regularly hear particular melodies in language while we're being yelled at, those patterns start to seem pretty abrasive. Even if we think of them as being distinct, they in fact share a number of properties and perceptual features. Another thing that may lead to the connection between music and emotion has to do with the physiological responses certain types of sounds make. So sudden sharp sounds tend to be physiologically arousing. You hear a loud, a loud clang of drums right behind you. It's likely to activate your sympathetic response. Your pupils dilate. Your heart starts to race. Your palms get sweaty. It makes you feel nervous. It prepares you to fight or flight. Another factor, another physiological factor that may affect how music leads us to have emotions、um, has to do with the sensitivity that we have for particular frequencies. You'll recall that we are the most sensitive to frequencies in about the 2,000 to 4,000 hertz range. This is an audibility curve like the one you read about early on in this in this unit. Now, all else equal, sounds that are about 2,000 to 4,000 hertz sound louder than other sounds. So many of the sounds that we find particularly abrasive, like Nails on a chalkboard, for instance, have high amplitude sounds at those particular frequencies. So we hear them as being particularly loud, and we find them pretty unpleasant. Some of the earliest modern work on music and emotion came out in the early '50s, and the claim that Meyer made in this book is that emotion is generally the result of satisfying or failing to satisfy some desire. We attain a goal state; it makes us happy. We fail to attain a goal state; it, it makes us sad. And Meyer argued that that this is what music does too. It sets up patterns and expectations, and when we try to predict those patterns, when we try to make expectations about what we're going to hear next, and we're right, it makes us feel good. So this back and forth of setting up an expectation and then being rewarded or not rewarded is what leads to the the emotional experience of music. Let's watch the wonderful Bobby McFerrin show us some things about expectations. Talking about expectations. Expectations. What? Ba, 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 So, although it doesn't actually matter if our musical expectations are right or not, from like a life or death kind of perspective, they're using the same kinds of circuitry that's used by systems that have more clear evolutionary benefits, in which predicting does matter. So, where do we get these expectations? How do we know? Why do we have a sense of what notes are going to come next? We get them, of course, from our prior experience hearing patterns of sounds. Flowing Data did this great analysis of 1,300 pop songs that contain an E minor chord. And what they tracked is what chord is most likely to follow an E minor. They found overwhelmingly it's going to be an F or an A minor. So even though you don't, you may not have consciously known this before you saw this chart, I certainly didn't.、Uh, we have become aware of those patterns over the course of our lives, listening to thousands and thousands of pop songs, such that when we hear an E minor, unconsciously we are likely to be predicting that the next thing that's going to happen is going to be an F or an A minor. When that does happen, and we have correctly predicted it, it feels good. We have satisfied our desire to be correct and make some kind of correct predictions. So the expectations that we have can be one of the things that affect why music has the emotional nature that it does. But there are other factors as well. One of the other factors is that over the course of our lives, music is likely to have been paired with other emotionally evocative scenarios. In America, we mark happy occasions with big, loud sounds in a major key. In movies, when good things are happening, we hear major chords. 
So in addition to any pre-existing associations we have with those or any physiological response, when we hear major chords, we have associations of the times in our lives where we've heard those happy major chords before. However, for sounds that are regularly paired with aversive stimuli, they can take on negative connotations as well. When you watch movies about a haunted house and you feel afraid and you hear that spooky music, those feelings become associated with those types of music and you become conditioned to associate those sounds with the feeling of fear. Now, given how heavily these can be influenced by experience, there are certainly going to be cultural differences in the way particular types of music make people feel. And there are also going to be individual differences. So there are things that are unique to our own personal lives apart from culture. Episodic memories, these explicit memories of, of events in our lives, may also be associated with music. So if you think back to uh, the song that was big the summer after you graduated from high school, yeah, so that song probably makes you feel feelings when you hear it. This is likely to occur because hearing that song leads you to recollect those episodic memories. And those episodic memories are also associated with emotional experiences. So indirectly, via those episodic memories, the songs make you feel the feelings or remember the feelings that you had when you, when you listened to that song most. The links between music and emotion may also be the result of multisensory associations. We talked in our multisensory association lecture uh, about how flutes seem kiki and bassoons seem muba. So things that are threatening in the world tend to be big. So big noises also seem more threatening. And tempo can matter as well. When we're sad, we tend to move slowly. We're lethargic. And slow music tends to sound sad too. When we're angry, we may be still and then suddenly move quickly and strike out. So music with sudden big stabs of sound sounds angry as well. So all of these factors can contribute to the emotional experiences that we have with music. And it's important to note that, that even if two people are presented with the same piece of music, and if somehow they had exactly the same episodic memories and multisensory association and cultural background, they may still differ in how much they like it. There's a nice parallel to be made here uh, with our discussion of spicy food, right? We talked about how people perceive spicy food differently depending on fungiform papilla density, experience, and so forth. But also people differ in, in how much they just like it above and beyond all those other things, right? Some people like the burn. So it's also possible that if two people both have some kind of physiological startle response from a piece of music, it may be that some people just like that physiological startle. Some people like being scared more. So all of these things are going to contribute to uh, the emotions that we feel when we hear particular pieces of music. What I want to remind you of at this point is that all of these amazing emotional experiences, along with our perception of spoken language, depend on tiny little sound waves, making the tiny little ossicles buzz, making little splashes in the cochlea, and making hair cells dance. It's an amazing process. So now that we've talked about all of the incredible things that the auditory system can do, and you have a good sense of how the auditory system works, I want to end the auditory unit by talking about the ways that things can go awry with auditory processing. How can hearing loss occur and what consequences does it have? Hearing loss is one of the most common conditions affecting older adults, and it's increasingly becoming more common in younger adults as well. People often think, incorrectly, that hearing loss just makes everything sound quieter, like it's turning the volume down on the TV. However, that is not the case. Hearing loss often systematically affects some frequencies more than others, making the sound that people can perceive sound muffled or distorted. I'm going to play you a little cartoon that has several different levels of simulated hearing loss, going from normal hearing at the beginning to profound hearing loss at the end. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Aha! Uh -huh. You're on my apartment building on Granite Avenue. You owe me 300 bucks. Get it up. Fred, take it easy. It's only a game. Wilma, well, I'm just like them big tycoons. I play to win. Now, Barney, pay up or get out of the game. Put the bucket. That's one down and two to go. Betty, it's your turn. I don't have any more money either. You got it all. Then I'll take the mortgage and your open talk. Hearing loss commonly occurs as a normal part of the aging process. As we discussed, younger adults can hear about 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, but as we age, that changes systematically. So older adults who have presbycusis or age-related hearing loss tend to particularly have the high frequencies of sound affected. 
So the chart here, the top line is showing the hearing thresholds for a young person at age 20, and then the thresholds for people as they get older. And what you'll notice is that as we age, we need louder sounds to be present in order for us to perceive them. That is, our thresholds are raised. Uh, and that's particularly true for high frequencies. So that the oldest line there, the orange line, uh, their, their hearing is somewhat impaired at all frequencies, but it is the most impaired at those high ranges. And note that that doesn't even go up to 20,000 hertz, but the pattern continues uh, as we get higher. So the fact that older adults systematically lose high frequencies more than low frequencies has led to the invention of some ingenious and totally mean devices. Let's say you have a space, a store, a mall, a neighborhood, where you don't want young people with perky hair cells that can still hear 20,000 hertz to hang out. What do you do? You play really loud, really high frequency noises that the young whippersnappers can hear, but the old fuddy-duddies can't. This is, a, this is a real thing. People actually do this. It's like, it's like dog whistles, but for teenagers. The wonderful twist to this device, though, is that teens have struck back by using very high-frequency signals to communicate in ways that old people can't process. So some hearing loss happens as a function of physiological changes associated with the aging process. But there is also non-inevitable hearing loss that can result uh, from exposure to loud noises. So one of the other ways that people can incur hearing loss is by exposure to loud noise. Now, the first way that this can happen when people are exposed to too much noise is that the, the tip links that connect the stereo cilia and, uh, and, and hold the ion channels open or closed, those tip links can tear. So this happens when there are loud noises that cause the basal or membrane to move more than usual, and the stereocilia press more firmly than usual against the tectorial membrane, thereby tearing the tip links. So if the ion channels stay open, it means potassium keeps rushing in, and those cells continue to be depolarized and fire action potentials. This is exactly what causes the ringing in your ears that you may hear after a concert if you didn't wear earplugs at the concert. Luckily, the good news about this kind of noise-induced hearing damage is that it's temporary. So the tip links are able to re regrow within about uh, 24 hours. The frequencies that you typically hear in this situation is kind of a high-pitched whining sound and tends to be focused at about 2,000 hertz. The reason that it's 2,000 hertz is that that is the first big bend in the cochlea coming around from the oval window. So that is the place where the waves crash into the wall of the cochlea the hardest and displace the basilar membrane the most. If you're exposed to even more noise or to loud noise over a longer period of time, there are different consequences. So first, look at this picture of lovely little stereocilia on hair cells. They are healthy and perky and eager to help you hear things. So noise causes gentle waves in the fluid-filled cochlea. Big noises cause big waves, tsunamis. They make the basal or membrane move a large amount and they smash those little hair cells up into the tectorial membrane and crush them. Look at those poor, crushed hair cells. So you're thinking to yourself, boy, that sounds bad. If they're crushed, how are they going to displace just the right amount and let in just the right amount of ions to let me hear things? Yeah, yeah, they can't. So now you're thinking to yourself, boy, that sounds bad. I wonder how long that lasts. Forever. Yeah, once hair cells are destroyed, they don't regrow. It's not clear why this is the case. Uh, for instance, some animals, like chickens, can regrow auditory hair cells, but humans can't. If you can figure out how to do this, there's a Nobel Prize waiting for you. So noise-induced hearing loss can occur instantly by having a very loud noise that happens just quickly. So if you have an explosion that's 120 decibels right next to your ear, that's likely to cause some, some permanent lasting damage. Hearing loss can also occur gradually. So if you look at this chart, it shows uh, how long you can safely be exposed to different intensities of noise. What you see is that as sounds get louder, the amount of time you can safely be exposed to them drops. Yikes, how can I avoid getting noise-induced hearing loss? I'm so glad you asked. Here's what you can do to prevent noise-induced hearing loss. The first thing is don't listen to your music too loud. But how do I know how loud is too loud? If you're listening to your music uh, using headphones or earbuds in a quiet room and someone who's about five feet away can hear the music, that means it's too loud. Okay, but what if I'm at a concert and I don't have any control over how loud the music is? If you're in a noisy venue, you can wear earplugs. But earplugs make the music sound bad. Ah, okay, so some earplugs do uh, muffle some frequencies more than others. 
foam earplugs like this are going to attenuate high frequencies more than low frequencies, and they do make things kind of sound a bit like you're listening underwater. But you can get a different kind of earplugs called edematic earplugs. Um, and these attenuate all frequencies pretty evenly. So things aren't muffled, they're just quieter. So you're saying I just have to carry earplugs around with me? Where am I even going to put them? Ah, there's actually a really great convenient way that you can carry your earplugs around. You know that fifth pocket in your jeans? It's an earplug pocket. Yeah, all right. I'll bring them if I remember them, but I might forget. Ah, well, if you're in Minneapolis, you're in luck. There's a city ordinance mandating that music venues supply free earplugs to patrons. But wearing earplugs isn't cool. What? That's ridiculous. You know what's cool? Being able to hear quiet noises when you're old. Also, as an incentive, if you send me a picture of yourself wearing earplugs in a noisy venue, I will print that picture out and I will hang it out on my office wall and you can join the other students that I have taught before on my wall of champions. Now, when people come into my office, they say, hey, who are those champions? And I say, oh, those champions are people who wear ear protection in noisy venues. And they'll say, wow, they're really cool. And I'll say, yeah, obviously, they're super cool. So you too can be part of that. All right, so that's how we prevent noise-induced hearing loss from happening to begin with. But once hearing loss has occurred, we have a couple of ways of treating it. So the most common way to treat hearing loss is using hearing aids. Hearing aids amplify frequencies that are the, the most impaired. So a clinician will do a hearing test in which they identify which frequencies are most impaired for a particular listener, uh, and then set up the hearing aid such that they amplify those frequencies preferentially. So here's a, so for our person who has presbycusis, the hearing aid is going to amplify the low frequency sounds a little bit and the high frequency sounds a lot. And they do this. The hearing aid contains a microphone that detects the sounds that are present out in the environment, amplifies them based on that particular listener's hearing profile, and then uh, projects them to the tympanic membrane in a way that then will represent what the sounds are actually like in the real world. Another method for treating loss are what are called cochlear implants, and these work via a very different mechanism. So in cochlear implants, there is an external microphone that picks up on the uh, acoustic signals and then transmits those to electrodes that are placed directly on the surface of the basilar membrane. How do you get electrodes on the basilar membrane? Well, a surgeon will feed a wire with those electrodes through the round window, which is an opening just under the oval window uh, in, in the cochlea, and feed it up through the basilar membrane uh, such that the electrodes are laying on the surface of the basilar membrane and when stimulated, cause action potentials in the neurons that are located uh, at, that, at that region of the basilar membrane. So if you hear a 10,000 hertz tone, it's gonna stimulate an area of the basilar membrane that has neurons who have a characteristic frequency of 10,000 hertz. So what do cochlear implants sound like? Well, it's hard to know for sure if you don't have one because you can't walk in that perceptual world. But researchers have come up with simulations that try to approximate what we think it sounds like to hear with a cochlear implant. Cochlear implants have different resolution, meaning they differ in the number of electrodes that they have and therefore the number of distinct regions on the basilar membrane that they can stimulate. Here are some samples of what cochlear implant simulations sound like. This is the same speech and music in both in both columns, uh, and what's changing is the resolution of the implant. What kind of bait do you use to catch salmon? What kind of bait do you use to catch salmon? What kind of bait do you use to catch salmon? <laughs> makes the auditory system beautiful is its elegant and mechanical nature, but it's also something that makes it fragile. Machines can break if you don't take good care of them. That's it for the auditory system, gang. We're going to wrap up today with a song that a former student from Sensation and Perception uh, put together just for this class. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely Sometimes behave so strangely. 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 
Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely. Sometimes behave so strangely.